It's widely accepted that the Balkan Peninsula had historically been the breeding ground for trouble on the local level and for geopolitical clashes between big players. And it has this reputation up to this day, which has become a cliché more than anything. There's this stigma that the hatred between Balkan neighbors is something that's there simply by default, that the people and countries have always been bloodthirsty maniacs who hate their neighbors. But what if I told you that this stereotype is actually very shallow historically and factually, especially in comparison with Central and Western Europe? You probably wouldn't believe me. That's why in the following 20 minutes, I will present you very important historical facts and conclusions and breach this facade of lies and half-truths which has come to define the Balkan region. Because I've personally had enough of this ordeal, which keeps our countries as poor, maldeveloped, right-wing banana republics which are good for nothing except as a laughingstock online. Exactly this is the main goal and virtue of my channel. So if you want to hop on the train of common sense and base conversations, be sure to subscribe and leave a like and a comment where you can, to push my content beyond the invisible barrier set by the algorithm. And if you're feeling like a real chat today, there's always my Patreon link down below, where you can support my content with a small monthly donation. I will start with a very unconventional statement, which is crucial for understanding the status quo. The Balkans aren't and haven't been as big of a bloodbath as they're presented to be. Looking at the history of wars and conflicts in the Balkan Peninsula and comparing it to the horrid devastation of wars surrounding the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, France and Italy, one quickly comes to an unbiased conclusion that much, much more blood was shed in the conflicts only between the ex-German states of Prussia and Austria alone than between Balkan ethnicities throughout history. This modern stigma had come from the fact that the First World War was triggered in Bosnia by a Serb, painting a picture of a war-mongering Balkan mentality, whereas in reality, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand was a reaction of oppressed peoples towards Austrian imperialism and hegemony, and was only the trigger, the last straw. The worldwide conflict was inevitable, and it was an ethnic conflict that started the First World War. It was the fight for liberty against foreign imperial powers amidst a huge power struggle. This trend has prevailed up to this day. But by rewinding a bit further into history, we can quickly see that antique and medieval conflicts between Balkan states have been equally prevalent as those in Central and Western Europe. Balkan nations haven't fought with each other any more than Germany did with itself. They didn't have much opportunity to do so either way, as after the fall of one imperial power, another quickly came by and stole the show, making the Balkans more of a geopolitical showdown than a bloodbath between the actual inhabitants. The fact that the name Balkan, meaning the land of blood and honey, is derived from Turkish, further implies that it's referring to Ottoman struggles to conquer and maintain hegemony in the region, because of the fiery and restless struggle of the inhabitants for independence, and not pointless warmongering conflict. The fall of the Ottoman Empire saw a unified Balkan alliance take down the occupator in the First Balkan War, showing that inherent hatred wasn't there between the ethnic groups themselves, but was rather directed towards imperial overlords. Before Ottoman occupation, the character of Balkan states and kingdoms was so ambiguous and unclear because of the intermingling and intermarriage between common folk and royal families that today's historians and history nerds have trouble agreeing on which medieval state was characterized by which nationality, which is a fallacy in on itself because nationalism in such form was imported from the West much later. This becomes very visible when you look at the Illyrian myth where several modern nationalities, most notably Albanians, claim direct and explicit heritage from this ancient group of tribes, which cannot possibly be traced directly to any particular Balkan nationality, except some linguistic roots. In the same fashion, historians have had a hard time labeling the medieval Bosnian state, which was ruled by Serbian and Croatian rulers, but later became majority Muslim through the Ottoman occupation. However, this is not to say that Balkan states have been angels. To the contrary, they've been as active at slaughtering each other almost as much as the rest of Europe was, 
which was shown by the backstabbing melodrama of the Second Balkan War and everything that followed. Slavic people in general are rightfully known as very temperamental, fiery, and sometimes even aggressive. I am in no way trying to deny this or the fact that the breakup of Yugoslavia was bloody and full of monstrous ideas and individuals. This potential for conflict was planted and amplified through the rise of fascism and installment of populist and fascist governments puppeteered by Germany, which guaranteed the first real bloodbath in the peninsula with the occupation and invasion of Yugoslavia and genocidal devastation by Nazi puppet governments in Croatia, Albania and Bulgaria, most notably the Jasenovac concentration camp, where, according to Serbian sources, almost 700,000 Serbs, Jews and Roma were killed by the Ustasha in such monstrous ways that even Nazi German officers were disgusted themselves. This was the first time in history that Balkan neighbors turned against each other in such a monstrous fashion, with a trend which will serve as the catalyst for the next bloodbath in the 90s, namely fascist and right-wing populist ideas imported from external predators. Nationalism had risen throughout Europe and the world, being used as a positive tool to unify tens and even hundreds of tiny nation-states into enormous empires, with Germany and Italy as prime examples. This patriotic nationalism had helped clear up the border gore of the European continent and had created an enormous shift in the balance of powers. On the other hand, however, Balkan states had been sold a cheap, broken version of this nationalistic ideal which hasn't led to unification, but to their demise. The same tool that was used to unify Germany and Italy in the 19th century was used to destroy Yugoslavia some 100 years later. Now, let me sum up this mess, which probably either confused you or made you think I'm full of shit. My claim is that nationalism and fascism, therefore hatred and warmongering, are not inherent properties of the cliché Balkan mentality. Historically, most wars fought on the peninsula had been rebellions against foreign imperial forces, which was also coincidentally the only instance where nationalism had a positive influence, where most notably Serbian people had rebelled against the Turkish overlords, for the first time having a sense of national unity. Unlike the fashion in which the Serbian Empire fell to the Turks, precisely because of a lack of such unity. So basically, while Germany was continuously fighting against itself for hundreds of years, Balkan ethnicities were busy driving off the Turks. Germany exited this phase of self-sabotaging puberty in 1871 and started bossing around. Balkan nations only got hatched out of the Ottoman corpse 40 years later, and immediately adopted a healthy structure in the form of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, which was quickly destroyed and raped by Nazi Germany and its puppets. What any of this has to do with today's status quo and the fact that most Balkan nations are ruled by warmongering autocrats who fill the region with fear of imaginary enemies and keep it at its past will all come together towards the end of the video. So keep your skepticisms at bay and keep watching. So by sweeping through the timeline, from the first medieval kingdoms to the imperial struggle for hegemony between Habsburg Austria and the Ottoman Empire, the liberation from the Ottomans through Balkan Wars and from the Austrians through World War I, the unison through the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, we come to the crucial point of history for understanding this Balkan myth. Fascism and chauvinism were a 20th century cancer which spread throughout the world and also landed amongst neighbors who rarely wronged each other in the past. Croatians were sold this myth of pseudo-Gothic origin by the Germans, which propelled their chauvinistic feeling of superiority, which resulted in large-scale genocide against Serbs, Jews and others, led by the Ustasha. Bosnian Muslims were sold the myth of apparent brotherhood with the Croatians, implying a common heritage, which resulted in complicit actions of the religiously extremist Hanja SS and later the Mujahideens, both united against a common enemy the Serbs. The Serb reaction came in the form of the Chetnik movement, a royalist, right-wing group of guerrilla fighters which in return committed numerous atrocities against Bosnian Muslims and other ethnic groups, 
while in several cases cooperating with the Ustasha even and the Hanjar, to fight off their true common enemy, Tito's partisans. These guys swore to restore the common state of Yugoslavia and eradicate fascism from the region, which they did for the most part. Just enough of it was left in the blood flow decades after the war for what was inevitably awaiting Yugoslavia after Tito's death. The shiny portfolio of invaded and destroyed nations by the American global empire has had Yugoslavia as an inevitable target. Not because we were special, not because we were a threat, simply because socialism and self-governance were not allowed in the new world order, and alleged democracy and liberty were knocking on Yugoslavia's door just like with dozens of other nations in Latin America and the Middle East. And sure enough, after World War II, multi-ethnic socialist Yugoslavia was a post-war industrial power, a viable nation, and an economic success. Between 1960 and 1980, it had one of the most vigorous growth rates, a decent standard of living, free medical care and education, guaranteed right to a job, one month free vacation with pay. Oh, when was the last time I had a month vacation? Oh, I can't remember. Affordable public transportation, housing, and utilities. Literacy rate over 90%. Life expectancy was 72 years. Most of the economy was in the public, not-for-profit sector. Now, such a country is a kind that global capitalism normally would not tolerate. Still, Yugoslavia was allowed to exist for some 45 years because it was seen as a buffer to the Soviet bloc, the Warsaw Pact nations. At the same time, efforts were made to undermine the socialistic features of Yugoslavia's economy. Yugoslavia opened itself up, up to Western capital penetration as early as the late 60s, early 70s, I, I think it was. Very simply, we got the answer, we'll borrow from the West. Well, once they started borrowing, with borrowing from the West came IMF penetration and an enormous debt. With debt came IF, IMF demands for restructuring. Restructuring is a euphemism for a harsh austerity program. In other words, you force your people to work harder for less, producing more, consuming less, and with that difference, you pay off your debt schedule or at least the interest that's accumulating on this wealth. In 1992, another blow was delivered against what remained of Yugoslavia. International sanctions led by the U.S. A freeze was imposed on all trade with Yugoslavia. The results brought utter economic disaster. Hyperinflation, mass unemployment up to 70%, malnourishment, the collapse of the health care system at great cost to the population. When things start going bad, when you've got when you've got sanctions, when you've got the loss of trade credits, when you've got 70% unemployment, when things are beginning to unravel and, and get desperate, that's when people begin to want to jump ship. And when you've got a U.S. national security state backing the most divisive, militant, fascistic national elements with fascist organizations arising in Yugoslavia that hadn't been seen in 45 years, armed with guns and money and organization and hired thugs and operating with a blatant assurance that they had the whole might of the U.S. to their backs. What I'm saying to you is that there was a conscious and deliberate plan to fragment and break up Yugoslavia. The other blow was in November of 1990, when President George Bush went to the U.S. Congress and pressured them to pass the foreign appropriations law that called for the cutting off of all aid and credits to Yugoslavia. The law also demanded that if any republic in Yugoslavia wanted further U.S. aid, it would have to break away from Yugoslavia and declare its independence. Okay, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's not my speculation. It's not my analysis. It's a public law. It's a public law. November 1990, the 1991 Foreign Appropriations Act. It's written right there. Go look at it. It required the U.S. State Department approval of election procedures and results in every one of the republics. It required that the republics do not hold national elections, but hold elections only in their own republics. 
and that the aid would go to individually to those republics. And when the aid did go, it went to those groups which the U.S. defined as democratic groups, which meant small right-wing ultra-nationalist and even fascistic parties. The ultimate goal was to break up Yugoslavia into a weak and helpless cluster of right-wing banana republics, privatized, deindustrialized. They wanted a Yugoslavia whose rich natural resources would be at the disposal of multinational corporations, whose populations would work at subsistence wages, whose economy offered no competition with existing capitalist producers, only new investment opportunities. They wanted a Yugoslavia whose petroleum, engineering, mining, and automotive industries would be undone and deindustrialized and they wanted to abolish Yugoslavia's public sector services and social programs. Now, why would U.S. policymakers, you really think U.S. policymakers are motivated by some need to abolish the social programs, the public sector services, and Yugoslavia? Why would they want to do that? Do you think they are such uh, nefarious, evil, intended individuals they would want to abolish their social programs? Come on, Parenti. Are you being paranoid? Well, why would they want to abolish our social programs? Now, to summarize my claims. 20th century fascism and ethno-nationalism implanted in Yugoslavia by Nazi Germany was a parasite, a ticking time bomb, used as a catalyst for the needs of American imperialism 45 years later. This prevailing hatred and nationalistic sentiment was used as the perfect excuse to demolish the Federation, which resulted in a full militaristic, monetary and political colonization of its successor states. Yes, you've heard me right. Our countries are colonized, no matter who you love or hate, no matter if you lick the colonizer's bottom or not. The reality stays the same. Demonization of neighbors and constant reminders and accusations of the tragic events of the 90s only keep the region in a state of hypnosis up to this day. The colonization of the rest of the Balkans happened in a less spectacular fashion, although equally effective. The European Union introduced a wonderland of promises and stories about the benevolence of European integration and in the early 2000s started incorporating Balkan nations which were desperately wishing for recognition and acceptance within the European community. Greece, Slovenia, Romania, Bulgaria and Croatia respectively. This step meant a total surrender of national sovereignty to the likings of Germany and the European Union. The surrender of any economic and monetary sovereignty to the IMF and World Bank, the destruction of the domestic industry in favor of quote-unquote more profitable options elsewhere, rapid criminal privatization of public property and insane levels of people leaving the country in search for a better life in Germany and Western Europe. None of which is accidental, especially the last part. Balkan countries are literally being brain drained and used as a source of cheap workforce for the needs of the rapidly growing Western economies. I myself have left Bosnia for Germany in the search for a better life, looking back at empty towns, empty streets, and dying nations. This is a reality I think everyone should recognize. No matter your experiences with or emotions towards neighboring countries or even your political views. Besides, you can keep calling this a conspiracy theory, keep lying to yourself that Serbs were and still are the main problem and troublemaker in the region, that we are poor because we're lazy, or even that we aren't poor at all, or my favorite, that the United States of America and its national security state and military industrial complex are angels on earth who are there only to protect you, your democracy, your interests, and your safety against evil Serbs. Only President Milosevic and Serbia stand in the way of peace. Serbia's mounting aggression must be stopped. One force that is the perpetrator of the problem, the Serbs, the Kosovars have been victims of terrible atrocities. In the past four months, we have seen some of the worst inhumanity in our lifetime. And we have to finish the job and build the peace. The blatant act of Serbian uh, expansionism and aggression, this, as then in my view, is uh, 
fascist thuggery on the march. When Serbian thugs were committing genocide in the Balkans, Dad didn't hesitate to call Slobodan Milosevic a war criminal to his face. And I was suggesting we bomb Belgrade. I was suggesting that we send American pilots in and blow up all the bridges on the Drina. I was suggesting we take out his oil supply. I was suggesting very specific action. And this I'd like to add my condolences to the families of those whose lives were lost during the wars of the 90s, including as a result of the NATO air campaign in terms of responsibility. And the leaders here have every right to seek retribution and let loose the dogs of war. That not only Albanians, but principally, all Muslims in the region were the victim of not an accidental, but a very well thought out, a very well planned late 20th century version of a final solution. A final solution concocted by one of the most maniacal men I have ever met in my life. Fear-mongering creates the need for security, and that security often inevitably comes in the form of tyranny. Most ex-Yugoslav nations chose this path, believing that US presence in the region is what protects them from evil Serbs, unwilling to admit the delusion they're living in. So, what's with the countries which weren't caught in the initial frenzy of EU integration? Let's take a look. Bosnia, with the Dayton Agreement of 1995, was configured in the perfect way for maintaining the status quo. Three presidents, two entities, an insanely ineffective political system with a high representative from the West, who basically has undisputed influence in political decisions, and a comical monetary system, where the central bank serves as an exchange office and has no authority of the country's monetary policy whatsoever. The former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, or North Macedonia, was caught in a web of disgusting manipulations by the EU and left empty-handed every time. No matter what you think about the name dispute with Greece, it's simply sad that a country is ready to literally change its name and adjust its identity to join an organization which ends up setting more and more demands. Furthermore, Serbia was an easy target, despite its traditional ties to Russia and China. I mean, it's easy to blackmail a country which has so much to lose if it doesn't agree on your terms. Salt was intentionally put on the Kosovo wound time and time again, whereas demands were made to track down and surrender alleged Serbian war criminals to the Hague Court of Justice in order to show everyone just how sorry they are for everything they've done in the 90s and make Serbs look as bad as possible. At the same time, gleaming eyes were directed towards Slovenia and Croatia, where the fear of missing out and empty stomachs were quicker than logic and an objective view of the European Union as an institution. Whereas Serbia was tamed with threats, Albania was one with promises. Kosovo was to be reclaimed from evil Serbs and given to its rightful owners. Except it wasn't, and never will be. That piece of land is nowadays a den of money laundering, covert military actions, human trafficking and sky-high poverty and unemployment rates. It's a colony, not a country. Not independent, not Serbian, not Albanian. It's home to the second largest foreign US military base and the most perfect modern example of divide and conquer. 
United States stood with you for your first 100 years of independence, and we will stand with you for the next 100, and the 100 after that, and the 100 after that. These facts should hurt every Serb equally much as they should hurt every Albanian. Last but not least, the seemingly insignificant nation of Montenegro was ripped from what was left of Yugoslavia and kept at bay by internally divided its people with hallucinations of Serbian neo-imperialism and expansionism which is allegedly jeopardizing Montenegrin national sovereignty. And apparently the only guy which can keep the poor country safe from evil Serbia was this guy, a former Serbian nationalist who had a change of heart and realized it's easier to be a lawless autocrat supported by the West and all it takes is to divide the country with these unfounded horror stories. By the way, he's been doing it for 30 fucking years. Yeah, democracy. I think it's time for all of us to just take a deep breath and open our eyes. Take a careful look at these people. Now, listen to me carefully. I'm not trying to sound like a doomsday predicting conspiracy smartass, but subtleness doesn't seem to work for some of you. Our countries aren't poor and underdeveloped and good for nothing because we're a lazy, incapable, warmongering bunch of apes, or because Serbs destroyed everything, or because Albanians stole Kosovo, or really whatever accusation you may hear. We are here because that's the place designated for us in the process of globalization. Every system has its center and periphery, with their respective levels of development. We are not and never will be meant to be the center of anything. We are third-class citizens of Europe, colonized banana republics with warmongering marionettes on the throne. These autocrats, these dictators, are people with many bad stains in their past, who are ready to stay in our present and future for the sake of undisputed rule. If you really think that the EU and US couldn't overthrow Djukanovic or Vucic if they really were concerned about democracy and human rights, they simply don't want to, because all of these people work in their best interests. An exchange of national interest for undisputed rule. And if they ever decided to speak up and retaliate, well, there's enough blackmailing material to send them all to Alcatraz in 30 seconds. If there's something you should take from this video, it's that you should start thinking for yourself. Balkan indoctrination is so incredibly powerful that even the brightest of minds get sucked in. And I don't blame them. If you feel like this video opened your eyes or simply aligned with your existing views, check out the rest of my content, where the main goal is to reset our collective mentality onto a healthy, rational, and self-aware path. No bullshit, no hidden agendas, no political indoctrination. Only the hard truth and best intentions. I remember during the Iraq war, uh, a student said to me, well, that's where you and I differ, you see, because I have faith in the president. He was talking about George Bush. I, I said, excuse me, you have faith in the president? He said, I trust the president. I have faith in him. So what, I said, what does that mean? You have faith in the president. This isn't religion. I mean, you have faith in him the way my Italian grandma had faith in St. Anthony. Do you have a picture of George Bush on your bureau? You light little candles to him, do you? <laughs> Democracy isn't about faith. It isn't about trust. It's about distrust. It's about accountability. It's about challenge. It's about debate. It's about exposure. It's about people becoming the active agents of their own lives, wanting to know what's going on. I don't have to trust you. I don't want to trust you. I want to see what's going on. Whose interests do you really represent, my friends? And yes, we, we, the real we, we, we really do have to do something. Call the White House, call your Congress people, your media, talk back, demonstrate, organize, agitate, educate yourself and others. Let them know how you feel. Don't think they're not interested, my friends. Oh man, are they interested in that? Oh man, do you think they are not watching you all the time? Why do you think guys like me are under surveillance? They want to know what the general public is thinking. They never stop thinking about you. When you say, oh, they don't care what we're thinking. Oh, no, they always, always focus on you because they know they're standing on your shoulders. And if this great mass began to shrug and rumble and all that sort of thing, it gets very wobbly up there. 
So against the lies. Against the lies and the homicidal violence of this national security aberration, the thin, frail voice of reason and democracy can become a mighty chorus and a strong resistance. I have seen it happen before, and we can make it happen again. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.